season. Uh, my name is uh, Greg Zawi, and we're here to talk today about uh, guidance for emergency pull cords in public housing. And, uh, you know, we uh, have had some incidences recently uh, that have precipitated us to say, well, you know, this is another thing that, that our risk control uh, department uh, would like to put out there for our members because, uh, like I was talking to Mike before, you know, with our most recent webinar with contracts, it isn't a problem until it is a problem. And uh, we've seen that uh, with respect to pull cords, uh, sometimes uh, they can be a problem if they're not properly maintained. And we'll go into this uh, with the webinar today. It's going to be a short, probably about a 30-minute webinar, and we'll open it up for, for discussion um, at the end uh, if anybody has any questions. But, um, you know, just first of all, my name is Greg Zawi, and I've been in um, uh, a risk control type of capacity for about the last 30 years within the insurance industry. i uh, worked at uh, three different companies throughout my career. Uh, one company that dealt with uh, high value homes, uh, another company that dealt with churches, and now I'm in the public and affordable space. So I've, I've pretty much run the gamut with types of buildings, dwellings, what have you, throughout my career. Um, but one of the things I really like to do, because I'm a frustrated history teacher that was in education and then transferred into the business school and then kind of never got back out. Um, but I, uh, I do love the educational portion of, of the job and putting on webinars like this and, and helping out our members and providing them information is, is one of the things that personally I find most satisfactory, satisfying, excuse me, about my job. Um, so when we're talking about pull cord systems. I mean, you know, this may not be the most, exciting thing. But if again, if I, if you all could take away one thing from this webinar, it's going to be worthwhile. Um, so what is a pull cord system? Uh, you know, a pull cord system is commonly found in, in some bathrooms uh, and, and, and in bedrooms in um, multifamily housing situations. And it, and it can be pulled, hence the name pull cord, in the event of emergency suffered by the user, such as a fall, or a lock-in, uh, you know, I mean, we've all seen the the old commercial, uh, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up, uh, you know, that's uh, that's kind of what we're looking at here, although those are a little bit different devices, but that's kind of what we're looking at when it respect to a pull cord. And uh, there's some things that when I did the research on the pull cords here that I really even didn't know myself. Um, United States federal law requires that in facilities with emergency cords, the system must work properly, and that's the only standard they have. I mean, in 2022, with all of our technology, the only standard they have, they have no standard that says it has to be uh, wired into a central station. There's no standard that says it has to be wired in locally. There's no sense uh, standard that says it has to be audible. The only standard that the United States federal law has is that it must work properly, and that's a very broad definition. And we'll see throughout the um, uh, presentation here that well, sometimes when you think they're working properly, they're not working properly, and tragedies can ensue if they're not working properly. Um, you know, emergency pull cords are a common feature in multifamily housing. They can be located throughout several uh, areas of the housing unit, but primarily in the bathrooms and bedrooms, and it signals an alarm when pulled. And like I said, leading up to this, alarm is a very, very ambiguous term. Uh, it may be audible. It may be to a central station. Uh, it may be a light. It may be something like that, but it signals a quote unquote alarm when pulled. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, I took away from this from a loss control perspective is that uh, eventually I think there should be more stringent standards as a regarding as to what is the proper type of alarm. Is the proper type of alarm just an audible alarm? Is the proper type of alarm something that rings into a monitoring system? And those questions really still haven't been answered. Um, but what has been answered um, is the HUD guidance when it comes to pull cords in public housing. And again, 
Uh, it's slightly ambiguous because there is no set standard with respect to what type of alarm it needs to be. All it needs to be is working. So, uh, you know, with HUD notice PIH 2019-25, it outlines the guidance with pull cords with respect to public housing. So if you, if you need that as a reference, that's where uh, the, uh, the PIH uh, uh, HUD notice is when it comes to that. Um, it's not required by HUD in all public housing situations, so you don't have to have it. However, it may be required as a reasonable accommodation under the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Fair Housing Act. So if you have people that have ADA compliant units, chances are that those are required to have a pull cord system of some nature. Um, so I'll just read the notice PIH when it comes down to it and you guys can determine for yourself whether or not that it applies in some of your situations. So in PIH 2019-25, it states that there is no programmatic requirement for public housing agencies to install call systems, such as call for aid pull cords or modern wireless electronic notification system technology in any public housing property, including housing properties that are occupied by the elderly or disabled or designated by the occupancy by disabled, elderly, or disabled or elderly households. Say that three times fast, right? The guidance states, in addition to any agency that chooses to install or maintain emergency call system is free to determine the type of system. We strongly recommend consulting with legal counsel or an appropriate subject matter expert if you're unsure whether these reasonable accommodations apply to your agency. So basically, there's a lot left for interpretation here. And I think that's one of the downfalls of the, the, the pull cord system is that um, it, there's kind of like a lot of, well, we can do this, so we can do that. We can do this, so we can do that. So uh, it, it leaves a lot of, for interpretation, even within the HUD uh, public notice. So, uh, you know, we're, we're going along here. And as we go along, I think what you're going to see from HUD is our, you know, technology develops. I think where you're going to see a, a more definitive stance, and I could be wrong, but I, my gut feeling is, is that HUD's going to have a more definitive stance on it in the future. As to when that may be, uh, you know, it's anybody's guess, but I think we're going to see a more definitive uh, stance on what types of alarms. There's going to be more parameters wrapped around what types of alarms, but we're just not there yet. Um, you know, but we get down to the next slide and we see that pull cord systems and REAC. So, you know, you all, you all go through your REAC and if you have emergency pull cords, they must be tested. If they're not functioning property, it constitutes a level three non-life-threatening health and safety deficiency on your REAC score. So, there's no inspection requirement for medical alert devices like bracelets worn around the neck or wrist, regardless of where the call for aid pull cords are located, they must be accessible, HUD notes in its guidance. And if a call for aid pull cord is inaccessible or one of the system components, a light, a buzzer or a notification or enunciator board does not function as intended when tested, it's a level three non-threatening life and safety deficiency. So that's basically when it comes to HUD, there's really not a lot of requirements on when you have to have them, but if you do have them, they have to be working. So, okay, what happens when they fail? You know, if a full cord system doesn't trigger an emergency assistance as designed, it could lead to tragedy. I mean, we've had a couple instances that we're going to go through uh, that we saw that uh, were tragic when it came to the pull cords not working properly. And again, they need to work up to their specifications. A pull cord that has an audible alarm, but not a, an alarm that rings into a central station, if the audible alarm is working, that's fine. If it has a, an audible alarm in addition to ring into a central station, 
and it rings into the central station, but the audible alarm is not working, that's not fine. So it has to work as designed. But as far as what the specifications are, they're very broad in scope. So we had an incidence here. Um, actually, I'm going to show you two incidences. The first incidence is um, out in Portland uh, at the Allen Fremont Plaza Apartments. And this is going back to 2010. And I'll just read the, the news blurb here to give you the scenario. Uh, it says, the daughter of a 68-year-old man who died after no one responded to emergency cords he pulled in his specifically equipped apartment is suing the building's owners for $3 million. Joseph Allen moved into the Allen Fremont Plaza apartments in Northeast Portland because he wanted to be sure someone would respond and needed, if, if he needed medical assistance, according to a lawsuit filed in Multnomah County Circuit Court. The former railroad employee suffered from severe asthma and the 64 unit apartment complex marketed itself as quote, a medically assisted living facility, unquote, the suit states. Allen's unit had three emergency cords, which were supposed to immediately summon medical assistance when pulled, according to the suit. On the evening of June 2nd, 2007, he pulled cords in two different rooms. The next day he was found dead by his daughter an oxygen mask resting on his face in a last ditch attempt to breathe, said attorney Russell Hamp. Essentially, he suffocated, Hamp said. This is not the first time the Allen Fremont Plaza has faced a lawsuit alleging its emergency medical alert system failed. Three years before Allen died, a woman died of congestive heart failure after she pulled an emergency cord in her unit and no one came to her aid for a state claimed in the 2007 lawsuit. According to the $1.2 million suit, filed by the estate of Dolores O'Neill, the complex intentionally disabled the emergency pull cord without telling O'Neill. Instead of calling an ambulance, pulling the cord merely turned on a light in the manager's office, but there was no manager on duty to see the light, the suit stated. An attorney who represented O'Neill's estate said the case was, quote, resolved, but he was unable to share details. The apartment management company did not return calls resting, requesting comment nor did the owner of the apartments located at 221 Northeast Fremont Street, several blocks from Legacy Emanuel Medical Center in Portland. Named as owners and developers in Allen's lawsuit are General Baptist Convention of the Northwest, GBC Inc., and J.M. Woolley & Associates. According to the Oregon State Council's Housing Council's website, the Affordable Senior Housing Project won the Governor's Livability Award in 1999 and was developed by Gene Woolley, who is a Housing Council member. Officials with Multnomah County Adult Protective Services could find no record that Allen Fremont Plaza is licensed as an official assisted living facility. If unlicensed, it wouldn't receive regular visits from government inspectors, Adult Protective Services, which investigates complaints of abuse or neglect at licensed adult care facilities. It would not say whether it has investigated the deaths of Allen O'Neill or any other residents at the Fremont Plaza. Um, Basically, what we had here is negligence on the part of the, the owners of the complex. They disconnected the portion of the alarm that rung into a central station. So therefore, they compromised its ability to work properly. Uh, again, uh, what's kind of unique about this situation had they not compromised that, say, for instance, that this pull cord system only had a light that flashed on a board in a, a management office, and that's the way it was designed to be, they would have been in compliance. However, they disabled the part that sent the call out to the central station, therefore putting them out of compliance. Um, so we're, we're talking about the, you know, the, amb you know, the ambiguous nature of what exactly constitutes a proper alarm? Uh, and in this case, uh, you know, they had a proper alarm and they chose to, to disable a portion of it, thus rendering it non-compliant. Uh, the second scenario, and I, I won't read this one in the gory details, but basically uh, it's the same plaza. And it was the one I mentioned before 
where a, um, a woman who thought she was pulling the alarm, uh, the alarm did not activate and she passed. Uh, again, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of, I don't want to say coincidental, but uh, it's, it's the same apartment complex. And these incidences happened three years apart from one another. But basically, the portion of the alarm system that was going to ring out was disabled again. And therefore, it rendered it not able to be compliant. Um, Greg, I wanted to, I wanted to yeah. make a point there because this is an interesting situation because um, in the first scenario, it was disconnected. It wasn't working. In this scenario, it was connected and working. And, you know, if this was a public housing situation and HUD had inspected it, they would have passed the inspection. But the manager wasn't in the room to Correct. see the alarm go. Off. So you could potentially be following HUD standards which like you had mentioned earlier, Greg, are very vague, but you could still put yourself in legal liability, uh, a, a legal precarious legal situation if you are not um, monitoring this constantly. So I think it, it brings up some other concerns, like may, maybe you're abiding by HUD or the federal government's rules, but you could still very much put yourself at risk. I just thought that was a point I wanted to make there. No, it's, and that's a point. That's a very good set off to, to kind of bring it at home here, Andrew, with uh, with what to do if you have obsolete or pull cord systems that are are in non-compliance, um, you know a pull cord system, a non-functioning pull cord system, shall I say, is a serious liability, and non-functioning pull cords should be removed or replaced immediately. Uh, this isn't something that we can say, you know, we're going to put it on the list to have it done within a five-year period. If you have pull cords and they're not working properly, the chances of something that catastrophic happening uh, increase. So you, this is one of those things that needs to be a top of the list item when it comes to if you have systems that are obsolete or if they're non-functioning. Um, so obsolete or non-functioning systems are still subject to REACT testing and HUD standards are met if the system, one, works as intended. That's the, what Andrew was talking about before. The key is work as intended. Uh, you know, if it was intended to only do a specific thing and it was doing that, then you're in compliance. If it was intended to do two or three things and it's not doing all of them, then you're not in compliance. Uh, number two, sounds an alarm to summon help from an intended source. Alarm, like I said before in the earlier portion of the program, very vague as to what an al alarm, quote unquote, is. Maybe audible, maybe ringing into a central station. It may be uh, a light on a board in the manager's office. If that's how it was intended to be, the alarm uh, is broad for interpretation, but it has to be an alarm as it was intended to uh, operate. And then third is available in each bathroom and bedroom of the intended unit. So those are the, the prime spots for accidents to occur uh, is in the bedroom or bathroom. Um, so bringing this home, I guess, uh, the bottom line here when it comes to, to emergency pull cord systems is that we found that one, emergency pull cord systems aren't broadly required in public housing. So you may or may not have them given on, you know, what type of housing you have, what your, you know, demographic is that you look at, you know, are you elderly? Are you a family site? You know, those are the types of things that all come into play, whether or not, you know, you decide to, you know, put public, uh, put pull cord systems in. Uh, again, sometimes they are required when it comes to specifically, say, ADA compliancy, but uh, there are situations, there are very few situations where they are required. Number two, if a system is installed, it must meet HUD inspection standards. And I think we went over that pretty much at length. Uh, number three, if using an emergency pull cord system, please ensure that it's tested regularly the same way you would fire extinguishers, the same way you would Ansel systems if you have cooking systems, the same way you would sprinkler systems. This is one of the things that you have to have on your testing list. Whether you do it monthly, whether you do it quarterly, whether you do it semi-annually, whether you do it yearly, you have to have it on your testing system. Um, and then finally, if a pull cord system is taken offline for any reason, uh, provide residents with advance notice 
and urge them to call 911 in case of an emergency. Uh, you know, as human beings, we get very programmed into doing things. So if you had pull cords in your units and now you no longer have them, uh, you know, that's a definite uh, uh, communication worthy uh, notice to your residents that we no longer have the pull system and then physically remove it if you no longer have it. Uh, please don't give them, uh, you know, your residents a false sense of security thinking that there's an emergency pull cord system there and only to have them pulling in vain in the event of a, an emergency and it's not going anywhere. So um, that pretty much wraps up uh, the discussion with respect to pull cords. Uh, does anyone out in the audience have anything uh, as far as questions, situations that you've arisen, anything anybody would like to share for the group today? Greg, I have a question. Sure. Um, we're right now um, getting ready to pull out our old system. It's been in our apartments since like 1980. Okay. Um, and we're replacing it. Um, it, ha it had just a light outside and a panel okay. in the community room so we could see what, you know, anybody there, any resident could see who it was. So we're installing a completely new system with, um, like it, it'll go directly to a, a center that's going to, to answer the calls, things like that. If something would happen like with one of the apartments that the emergency cord isn't working and we figure that out, right now they're all working, but something would happen before we get this new system installed. Is it best for us to just remove that system and tell them to call 911 if they have an emergency from, from would... just like one apartment? Would that be possible? I would say in the transitionary period, what I would do, I would put out a communication stating to all your residents that we're in a transitionary period. We're going from a, a system that we installed in here in 1980 that all it had was the lights. And everybody will know, you know, yeah, we got the system with the lights. We're going to a system and explain what type of system you're going to. But also explain to them, you know, that, we're going to be in a transitionary period in the interim. We're not going to be repairing the old system as the new system comes in and make them aware that in the event of emergency, we're going to use 911 until the new system is in place. I think that way you've got your, all your bases covered because they're going to start yanking on the cord, guaranteed. So if it lights up, great. But I think in the transitionary period, you're going to need to have your bases covered with your residents and, you know, quite frankly, kind of, you know, protect your own backside a little bit when it comes to we've communicated this, that we're going in a, a transitionary period. And, you know, who knows, like when, when, when somebody's working on um, the new system, you know, uh, it's, it's not going to be done in an afternoon. So there may be, you know, fuses that have been pulled, uh, uh, certain units may have been disabled as they're retrofitting the new system in, uh, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. And the last thing you want to do is to have somebody fall through the cracks, so to speak, uh, by, oh, yeah, we thought the pull cord was working and it didn't work and nobody ever advised us to do anything else. So I was saying in your transitionary period, I would advise everyone, not just a resident, say, for instance, if you had like, okay, we know that, you know, unit number 101 has its light out. So we're going to just tell the person in 101 that they've got to call 911. I would make it blanket, call 911. We're in the middle of our transition of our pull cord system. And, you know, once the new pull cord system is 100% activated, then we're going to go transition to that. But now, right now we're in the transitionary period. Does it make sense? Make sense? It does. Thank you so much. Okay. Greg, I had a, a point to make actually off Beverly's comments and I'm, I'm sure, sure Beverly and her organization has this handled, but for others who are maybe looking to get a pull cord system in the future or replace one, and we had this conversation last week, Greg, about contracts, is right. if you're working with a third party company that to monitor that system, which often these newer systems are, they're not just going to the light in the office, it's going to a security company that they then call 911, that you want to make sure that your contract with them has language in it that protects you, holds you harmless, indemnifies you in case the third party contractor doesn't notify authorities properly or there's an issue with the system and something 
unfortunately happens to the resident who was putting that notification out because they could come after the housing authority still. So you wanna make sure you have language, make sure legal counsel reviews that contract, to make sure it's favorable to your housing organization. You're not held liable if something goes wrong with that third party contractor you're working with for the notification. Great point, Andrew. Great, great point. Um, you know, especially when it comes to situations where, you know, human life is involved, you're going to want to have your yourself covered in the event that, you know, you're doing all your things correctly, but maybe someone else doesn't. So yeah, most definitely. Right. We have uh, two things. We have Colleen's got her hand up and then Brian asked a question in the chat. Uh, if we can remove an existing full court system, which you've kind of answered yeah. uh, there. But um, go ahead, Colleen, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question if you're if you're ready. Hello, I, I just wanted to, um, in regards to Beverly replacing the system, we had a similar situation here with um, non-function and full courts and went through a process of, um, you know, some apartments working, some not. And the direction that we went is um, we were advised by um, the director of city codes that um, if the court is there, it has to work regardless of what we're doing in the building. So what we did is we had okay. maintenance go into apartments and cover the pull cords with blank cover plates. So the cord no longer exists. So it's okay. not there to be pulled and then left a notice in the unit and discussed with the residents individually that there is no more cord if there is an emergency call 911 so then we we weren't faced with any liability of no one told me that i don't okay. know how to read um you know the different things that may come our way um okay. so we eliminated the cord by temporarily covering it with a blank plate so just a suggestion very good very good no that no that's 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 great i mean um I, you know it, it's one of those things where you know, we, we automatically think of, okay, I, I got to have the course, but HUD's guidance is unless it's a certain situation, you don't have to have the course, but they have right. to be working if they're there. Correct. So it's not like you're putting a cover over a, a, a fire alarm saying, well, you know, right. just put the, right. cover over the fire alarm. We don't need, we need the fire alarm. But Correct. as far as the pull cords is, they're not mandated, but if they're there, they need to work. So great call. Thank you so much for 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 adding that. And you know, this is this is one of the reasons why we have these these webinars and and these sessions like this is because, you know, we don't even know a lot of stuff about everything when it comes to it. I mean, we know a lot of stuff, but as far as pull cords, this was really the first time I've delved into the whole issue of pull cords. So I've done a lot of research, but my point is is that, you know you all are a great resource to one another uh, by being on these calls and learning from what your fellow folks at your uh, fellow PHAs have done uh, in, in these certain real life situations. Uh, you know, I, I know what I've researched. You know what you've actually done. So this is, this is uh, you know, fantastic when it comes to the, the interaction that we can have with uh, the, the PHAs with one another. And, yeah. and, you know, we sit up here and facilitate that. So that that's fantastic. So thank you very much for adding that because that- Greg, Greg two things. Huge. We got um, one point I wanted to make off Colleen's suggestion was that, um, that remember to check with your local authority having jurisdiction, local building officials, because they might have specific regulations regarding your pull cords as well. So before you make any changes, check with your AHJ um, to make sure that you're complying with local code. And then, um, Greg, Mike Hunter has his hands up. Uh, Mike, yeah. go ahead. Go for it, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Quick uh, one. I appreciate the conversation as well. I think we just have, that I'm aware of one property also built in the 80s with a pole cord. And yeah, it's a REAC HUD. Um, it's a subsidized site. So the question about the contracts led me to another question. Has anybody put a clause in, in a lease with the residents to, it may not hold water in court, but at least stating, you know, it's an attempt to, to be there for assistance, but if it, you know, trying to get us out of a liability, is there any clause in some leases like that? I, I don't think we have, I hadn't even thought of that question before. Not that I'm aware of, uh, you know, although this is definitely a, a better question as you posed it to, for the group, as opposed to, to us. Uh, I'm not aware of the, that situation occurring where somebody could sign off on that, but uh, I mean, 
I guess and, anything you know, would be possible. You yeah, can it's like it, anything. But it might not hold up. But it yeah, exactly. that's what I'm saying. It might not hold water, but yeah. you know, you're going to put it. You might put it in your lease, but it, it's like it has been said, and like React, if it's there, it needs to work. And, exactly. Yeah. So I just think it's a warning system for residents in case it doesn't have a backup plan. You know. Yeah. But, and, and that's and that's one of the things that you know these systems. Uh, a lot of them are getting a little long in the tooth. Um, because they came on the scene in the late 70s, early 80s, this, this whole technology. And a lot of them haven't been re-updated since then. Um, very common scenario was the pull cord and the light outside the room and or the little light up board in an office or in a common hallway. Uh, and I still see those uh, every day when I go out and look at properties. Um, as we get more te technologically advanced, I think we're going to start to see that. And I, I don't think, I know we're seeing it moving towards a central station monitoring system where when the cord or a button or something is activated, that it sends a signal to a monitoring company who in turn sends a signal to the proper authorities, whether that be the fire department, whether it be the management group or what have you. But, uh, you know, that's the way we're moving. And some of these systems are 40, 45 years old. And, you know, they're they're prone to like anything else. They're mechanical and they're prone to break down. And, you know, it's uh, it's probably about time if you're operating on those older systems, it's probably about time to start researching what the new technology would be. Greg, we have another question from Carissa. And I think this goes back to local building code, but okay. maybe you have some insight. She said, um, uh, she's asking how far off the ground pull cords need to be. And I, I know from experience looking at some of the HUD regulations that they don't specify that exactly. They do not. They, they do just, not. it's very vague, but. They do not. Um, and Carissa, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to, after we get off there, I'm going to do a little research on if there is any minimum standards pertaining to code where these pull cord boxes, if you will, or, 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 or appliances need to be situated. Do they have to be three feet off the ground? Do they have to be X number of feet away from a window? Do they have to be this? Do they have to be that? Truthfully, I don't know if any of those things exist. I um, I, but as we all know too, um, there probably is something out there somewhere because you just can't leave people to their own devices with quote unquote common sense. Um, you know, you'd have people putting them on the ceiling and on the floorboard and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So there, I'm thinking there have, has to uh, be some sort of per parameters, but I don't know for sure. We have Missy saying, um, Missy Smy says, I believe React says six inches from ground, which we can confirm and we can we, follow up in our follow up email. We can we can pull out that section from React. So it's clear. Now, Perfect. Missy, is that um, a, a, a maximum, a minimum of six inches from the ground? It has to be at least six inches from the ground. At least. Okay. She said at, at least. least. Okay. okay. So the, the verbiage is it has to be at least six inches from the ground. Which makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I don't want to be putting your emergency on the, on the baseboard or on the ceiling. So uh, we will get you the actual um, uh, clause within uh, React as yep. far as that goes. And we'll put, like, as Andrew said, we'll put that out in the follow-up. And that way you guys could have that for your reference. Yeah. It looks like Carissa, uh, her organization ran into an issue where then inspect inspection with Inspire, they were told they were not in regulation, but they did not tell us what it was. So maybe gotcha. it was the, maybe it was the height thing, maybe it was something else. So okay. I wish hopefully they would have given you more information on that. And Brian mentions that it depends on the inspector too. So oh well, you know that's <laughs> that's that's the case in 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 many instances. I mean, uh, you know, we are human, and and there is some interpretation and. Uh, unless things are specifically spelled out, but it sounds like we've got with that with that rule within React, it sounds like it's it's got some specificities uh, attached to it. So we'll get that out to you. But yeah, uh, to your point, Brian. I mean, uh, the ins whoever inspects it does go a long way as to whether or not you know they're going to come down on you hard or if they're going to kind of just you know take it in the spirit of the law, if you will. We've got a few hands up. Um... Yeah. Feel free to speak up if you're if you have a question. Yeah, go, go for ahead. it. Just just. Okay, I just wanted to tell you um, we're the ones putting in the new system. Okay. And 
most of the people felt it, it seemed like they'd never heard of a pull cord system. So yeah. they, I don't think I don't know if they don't manufacture them anymore, but I did look for them. So I'm kind of relying on them. I think you put like the pull cords, people would tie them up. They didn't want them hanging down to onto right. the ground or to the, you know, where it needed to be. We got written up for that, first of all, plus if they had a dresser in front of it. So we mm -hmm. got that. Um, but these new things, they're just a button. And I think he said they have to be, you know, fairly close to the ground, because if somebody does hit the ground, they're going to have to be able to reach them. But um, I can't, I couldn't even find pull cord system replacements. So I just wanted to put that out there for people. I, I would have liked to have had the pull cord just because I thought it gave them more reach. But it looks, I couldn't find anybody that even installs them anymore. Really? Interesting. 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 The Inspire standard for pull cords is, is the same as React. It's six inches off of the floor. We just went through okay. 15 okay. Inspire inspections and it's six inches off the floor. Okay. All right. This is great. I mean, um, I truthfully, when um, we decided to do this re with regards to pull cords, uh, I really didn't think we'd have this much discussion around it. And this is fantastic. Uh, you know, I love it. Uh, anybody have anything else before we wrap it up? Please send us your feedback, everyone. Sure. Yeah. And I would, um, yeah, this is uh, the QR code if you'd like to scan that or just uh, there's also a, uh, a website there um, for feedback. And it's always, always good to get feedback with respect to, you know, it helps us realize what our members value. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would just like to, to put a little bit of a disclaimer out there for the department. Um, you know, please uh, continue to use our risk control and consulting department here at HAI Group as a resource, whether it be one of our uh, risk control consultants coming out on site to visit you, or whether it be virtual through webinars, through collaboratives, uh, through anything we do, whether it be visiting our website to our risk resource center, uh, you know, please continue to, to use us. Uh, you know, we view you as, 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 as such valued partners and that's why we do things like this. That's why we have these types of webinars on, on pull cords and contracts and severe weather and things like that. So, uh, you know, we we really do to value you. And uh, you know, I just like to to just extend that out uh, going forward uh, throughout 2023 and beyond. That uh, you just continue to use us as a resource because we're here for you. So, uh, I guess with that, uh, again, I'd like to wish you all happy holidays and. Just have a, a, a pleasant, a prosperous, and a safe 2023. So thank you all for, for attending today. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye now. Thank you. You're welcome.